For decades, surgery of the nose and paranasal sinuses has been the gold standard for the treatment of patients with chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps that are uncontrolled by medical therapy. But surgery isn't a panacea. In severe patients, symptoms may return and the disease becomes uncontrolled, even with appropriate medical therapy. Further surgery follows with mixed results. But have we now reached a stage where new drugs can offer a paradigm shift in the treatment of CRS with NP, where surgery is no longer considered the gold standard? No surgery or no surgery? That is the question. This is the Euphoria Innovation Forum debate on CRS with NP setting the new gold standard. Hello, I'm Dr. David Bull and welcome to this Euphoria Innovation Forum debate. It's fantastic to have your company. Chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps or CRS with NP is a chronic inflammatory condition of the nose and the paranasal sinuses which causes a significant impact on the lives of those patients affected. Now it's estimated to affect about 1-4% to of the general population and about 25-30% to of patients with chronic rhinosinusitis. And there is an underlying inflammatory process at work which is called type 2 inflammation. And this means that CRS with NP often presents with comorbidities including asthma and allergies. Patients suffering from CRS with NP experience symptoms of nasal obstruction, smell dysfunction with anosmia, continuous nasal discharge and facial pain, and all of these have a massive impact on the patient's quality of life. And living with this condition can also profoundly affect people's mental health and psychological symptoms, including depression, are common. And with so many people affected by the disease, there is also a significant economic impact too, including the cost of providing recurrent healthcare, absenteeism from work and lost work productivity. So it is vital that we continually improve the care that we can offer to patients with CRS with MP and in turn improve their quality of life. Well, to bring the subject alive and to debate what the new gold standard for CRS with MP should be, we've assembled a world-leading panel of experts and an advocate from all parts of the globe. And I'm delighted to introduce them all to you now. From Amsterdam in the Netherlands, Professor Witzke Fokkens. She is Professor of Otorhinolaryngology at the Academic Medical Centre. She is also Secretary General of the European Rhinological Society and Chair of the European Position Paper on Rhinosinusitis and Nasal Polyps, or EPOS. From Rome in Italy, Dr. Eugenio de Corso. He is an ENT specialist in the Institute of Otorhinolaryngology at the Gemelli University Hospital Foundation and leading the Italian Registry on Biologics for CRS with MP. From Norfolk, Virginia in the United States, Professor Joe Han. He is Chief of the Division of Rhinology and Endoscopic Sinus and Skull Base Surgery at Eastern Virginia Medical School. From Barcelona in Spain, Professor Joachim Mullol, who is director of the Rhinology Unit and Smell Clinic in the ENT department of the hospital clinic Idibabs. And last but by no means least, from Harlem in the Netherlands, Alexandra Banning, representing the Euphoria Patient Advisory Board. Now, we're going to divide our debate into three sections, and the first section will be about nasal polyps in general. We'll talk about the disease characteristics, what CRS with NP is, the historical treatments for the condition, and the mechanism underlying it, that is, type 2 inflammation. The second section will address the advent of biologics in the treatment arsenal, and we'll talk about their advantages, their role in the treatment of patients, and how they can improve patients' lives. And the third section will look at the challenges to implementing new therapies and the ambitions and aspirations for patient care. (music) 
So let's start our debate looking at nasal polyps and the role of sinus surgery. Now, nasal polyps is a form of chronic rhinosinusitis with benign inflammatory structures that arise from the mucosa of the paranasal sinuses. Chronic sinusitis can exist with or without nasal polyps, but it's still unclear why some patients develop nasal polyps and others do not. First line treatment tends to be the use of medication to reduce inflammation and surgery is recommended as the second line treatment. But don't take my word for it, let us now talk to the experts uh, themselves. I'd like to start, if I may, with you, Professor uh, Joe Han. Uh, let's start right at the very beginning, if we may. Could you just tell us what nasal polyps are, uh, how many people have them, and how many of them then have CRS with NP? So, so I would say, you know, chronic sinusitis is, is actually a very common chronic disease. In the U.S., uh, it varies between 11 to 17 percent of the U.S. population. Um, and the reason why it's not completely accurate in the U.S. is because the, the database in diagnosing CRS is not um, very well collected. But we do know that, um, that CRS with nasal polyps, meaning that based on physical exam or on nasal endoscopy that you can see a polyp coming out of the osteomial complex, we know that if you could see it, these patients who have chronic sinusitis would then be determined as chronic sinusitis with nasal polyp. Now, as you mentioned earlier, um, it does account for 25 to 33 percent of the patients with chronic sinusitis. But, you know, there are new studies that are coming out that when we're looking at the type of inflammation in patients with CRS, we may have it wrong. Maybe the percentage of patients with CRS with nasal polyp may be higher. So, for example, when you're doing sinus surgery, sometimes you don't see polyps in the osteomere complex, but when we're opening up into the sinus cavity, we see your typical polyps. So then would that patient be a CRS with nasal polyp? So the, the definition of CRS with nasal polyp may be uh, further defined, refined. Thank you very much indeed. May I move to you now, uh, Professor Fockins? Uh, I talked a, a bit there about type 2 inflammation. Could you, could you explain exactly what type 2 inflammation is? Certainly. Well, I've tried. Type 2 inflammation is a form of inflammation that uh, is uh, around eosinophils, a certain inflammatory cell uh, that you can find in the, in the polyps, in the nose, but also, for example, in the lungs when patients have asthma. These eosinophils can be very aggressive cells, and they are pulled into the tissue and activated in the tissue by a number of cytokines. And important cytokines are IL-5 and IL-4 and IL-13. And uh, these cytokines make that cells can talk to each other, and in that way, um, make the inflammation uh, in the in the polyp. Thank you very much uh, in, indeed. That was a fantastic explanation of type 2 inflammation. And perhaps I may now bring in uh, Professor de Corso. I said um, really right at the beginning that uh, the gold standard was always considered to be sinus surgery in the treatment of uncontrolled CRS WNP. <laughs> Uh, i.e. those people who don't respond to medical, uh, medical uh, therapy after surgery. And, and so for me, it does seem to make perfect sense that you remove the obstruction. But I don't think it's that simple, is it? It's not so simply. I believe that the role of surgery should be reconsidered in the light of the new therapeutic opportunity. And the most important question is now we are doing first time surgery on revision surgery. Surgery is very effective in this patient. Usually it leads to a very quick relief of symptoms and particularly in nasal obstruction. And furthermore, sinuses are better accessible to local treatment and that increase uh, disease control.
In my opinion, if a patient has never undergone surgery, endoscopic sinus surgery should be considered if symptoms are not controlled with adequate medical treatments, such as nasal irrigations, local corticosteroids, and a brief cycle of systemic corticosteroids. On the other hand, we, if we have a patient who have never undergone at least one surgery, one criticism could be if the surgery was appropriate. If it was complete and if the extension was based on the endotype of the disease. We are discussing about this, post, uh, this point because actually there is not agreement about that. <laughs> In short, if a patient underwent a dark Ad adequate surgery, biologic should be proposed as an alternative treatment. And there is also the situation of patients not fit for surgery. And in this case, biologics may be proposed as first-line treatment if, if they satisfied the right criteria. Nevertheless, the crucial point is what do we mean by fit for surgery? Some patients totally refuse even the idea of surgery and not because there are significant contraindications to be operated on. Finally, we have the situation of patients who perform adequate surgery, but symptoms and polyps recur very quickly postoperatively. And in addition, there are some cases that underwent multiple surgeries and in these cases, it makes no sense to me to propose further surgery. So we have also to consider comorbidities and in particular asthma and uh, its severity. If asthma is the, drive, uh, the driver of severity, it is more appropriate to start with biologic and surgery may be considered as a salvage treatment if nasal symptoms are not controlled. And finally, there is the topic of negative predictor predictors of surgical outcomes. There are patients with an high load of inflammation that we name I type 2 patients. And some may speculate that in this patient we should start with biologic, but there are not enough data to support this now. So with this premise, you can understand uh, how is important the counseling? We have to speak very well with the patients and clarify the options available now. I, I knew it wouldn't be that simple and I really like the points that you made there and particularly talking to the patient. So let's talk to the patient. Alexandra, if I may bring you in now. Tell me, you know, in that introduction, I sort of, uh, I sort of gave a summary of what it's like to have CRS with NP. Tell us, what are your symptoms uh, and, and, and how, it, how it sort of presents for you? Um, well, I, I was luckily, um, well, luckily operated by Dr. Wieske Fokens. Uh, the last time she operated me, it was a draft three operation, which means that uh, she made, um, well, obviously, obviously one of the doctors can better explain the uh, draft re operation. However, it was a very uh, severe uh, operation. And um, my, my, uh, the quality of life was for me, although I, I was still able to work, I had a lot of, um, yeah, sickness uh, days. Uh, and had to recover from operations every time because um, I think I have had like 20 operations in total, um, which started with the cold well look, which was when I was in my teens uh, years. That meant that they open up uh, in your in your uh, yeah in your mouth and they get away every uh, all mucus and everything and they um, stitch everything in. Well, I, I can um, tell you that it's a, a tremendous um, impact on your life, mm. especially when you have to deal with yeah 
day-to-day -day business in your life. Well, absolutely. And of course, you mentioned there taking time off work and also, uh, and you make a really interesting point about growing up with this and clearly having those symptoms has a huge impact. We talk about the psychological uh, impact of this. For young people, this must be absolutely horrendous. It is, because um, uh, for me, it also had uh, included uh, air operations. So I um, had a loss of uh, hearing, but not uh, due to um, uh, difficulties with hearing, but because of the mucus now, uh, yeah, sort of find this way out uh, through my ear. So uh, I had uh, to wear a hearing aid for 10 years till the time Dr. Fokkens uh, uh, suggested uh, biologicals for me. And since then, it's unbelievable, uh, yeah. sort of advertisement. But uh, yeah, I, 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 I didn't uh, use the hearing aid anymore. I mean, that is really quite extraordinary. Well, let's bring in Professor Fockins, if I may. I mean, it sounds absolutely horrendous. Uh, and I think many uh, physicians probably underestimate the, the impact on people's lives. I mean, it really is very significant, isn't it? As we heard from Alexandra. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely a, a terrible disease. And very often that's one of the things my patients tell me all the time is, I would rather have uh, um, a cancer, you know? They say, there's nobody who understands how I feel. I can never sleep through the night. Uh, I always feel, well, imagine how you feel after when you have a very severe cold. That is what patients feel every day of their life. Uh, they can't sleep, they block, they can't smell. Smell is very important in, um, well, you can't smell when there is a fire, so people are afraid. They can't taste their food. Um, uh, very often they also have asthma. So it's a horrendous disease. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, well, you hear what Alexander told, being operated so many times. And every time again, we try to uh, remove the polyps again and uh, remove as much of the diseased mucosa as possible and give access uh, to local treatment, but in severe patients like she is, that's just not enough. Mm -hmm. It doesn't help. Uh, thank you very much indeed. I'd like to bring in Professor Han now, if I, if I may. I mean, I think all of us as clinicians are aware that medicine is a constantly evolving field. It changes all the time. I mean, a, a number of people have mentioned biologics. Alexandra mentioned biologics there as well about revolutionizing that kind of patient experience. Um, could you just explain what biologics are? That would be a very good place to start. Yeah, so biologics are a new class of um, pharmaceutical treatment for our patients with CRS with nasal polyps. I mean, they've also been also introduced in other diseases, as chronic diseases as well, like asthma, atopic dermatitis. We even see in people with rheumatoid arthritis. So these are not small molecules. These are proteins. Um, they're specifically called monoclonal antibodies. And uh, what they do is they target specific uh, inflammatory cytokines. So as uh, uh, Whiskey said, you know, like the IL-4, IL-5, IL-13, these monoclonal antibodies specifically target these inflammatory cells that are causing those chronic inflammations. So that's what biologics are in kind of quick summary. Uh, thank you very much indeed. I mean, I think all of you have really encapsulated this brilliantly about uh, the recurrent surgery, the fact uh, we saw the disease burden there from Alexandra, and of course uh, the biologics and how, how they have uh, changed and revolutionized uh, patient care. Thank you very much indeed uh, for the moment. That was incredibly informative. So now we understand more about nasal polyp CRS with NP, the underlying inflammatory mechanisms behind it and the role of medication and sinus surgery to treat it. Let's now move on to look at a paradigm shift, the advent of those biologics. Now, as we heard, biologics are a new treatment option for severe patients with chronic rhinosinusitis with NP, and they specifically target the underlying inflammatory process, that is the type 2 inflammatory cascade, and many people have called them 
a game changer. Let me start with you, Professor Mullol. How, uh, so could you just uh, sort of uh, fill us in uh, again, add a bit more uh, context to this in terms of how biologics actually work and the theoretical advantages to them? Well, as it has been told before, uh, the action of uh, biologicals it's known to, to block some of these molecules, interleukin-5, interleukin-14, interleukin-4, interleukin-13, or IgE. Uh, uh, but uh, there are much more actions that still need to know about the mechanism of action. Uh, what the, uh, from the patient's perspectives, the improvement is related to a number of issues. First of all, the improvement of uh, symptoms, uh, improvement of nasal obstruction, rhinorrhea, uh, facial pain or pressure, and mainly the loss of smell, because uh, about 80% of these severe patients, severe and controlled patients, uh, have loss of smell. And the improvement of these symptoms, it's a, a big improvement on the concept of quality of life. Quality of life, it's also the next point. And when we talk about quality of life, we talk about many issues, for example, related to uh, uh, nasal symptoms or uh, ear symptoms, because uh, severe patients also have ear disease, or improvement in sleep, or improvement in mood, or reduction of, of the depression that is caused by the disease. Uh, also, the severity of the disease is reduced, and the patients notice this because they reduce the need of using medications such as short courses of oral steroids that have uh, side effects in the, in the body, or reduce the need of surgery, uh, or, the, or at least the repetitive uh, surgery, and also improves uh, the, not only the upper airways, but also the lower airways. A lot of patients, of these severe patients, two out of three, usually have asthma, and one third usually have aspirin intolerance, that is, is this triad, is the, the most severe and difficult to treat disease in this group of patients. And even there are some studies that demonstrate that this sensitivity to uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs can disappear with the, with the constant treatment of these uh, uh, drugs, the biologicals. And all of this makes a big improvement. And some of these of improvements, for example, the loss of smell, and in some, using some of these biologicals, improve very fast. There are patients that have been without sense of smell for 10, 15 years, and they uh, notice the improvement on the sense of smell in few days after the first shot of these drugs. Hmm. I mean, it sounds absolutely extraordinary. Alexandra, uh, can I bring you in here? Um, does that story sound right to you? You sort of mentioned at the beginning of the show that biologics had made a, a big difference to you. Just tell us your story. Um, well. As from the moment I, I took it, I, I still remember the month and the year, I, I think it was December 2019. Um, yeah, it was extraordinary. I mean, it is, um, yeah, I, I, I had made a sort of promo film and I, I remember I said, even if it takes out 10 years of my life, um, I, I, I still want to, to use the, the biologic. Um, although, you know, you do not know what are the side effects. Um, but at this moment, yes. Uh, often I ask, I'm still under control of the uh, UMC. Uh, and I always ask, uh, you give me the next uh, injections because... <laughs> I, I am afraid uh, they take it away from me. <laughs> so yes. ju so ju just in terms of, of what we heard uh, there from uh, Professor Muller, just how, how quickly did they work for you? Uh, if I may just go back to you, Alexandra, how quickly did they take effect? F very quickly. I, I, I think within, well, 
the, the, the professor mentioned five days. I, I cannot recall the exact, uh, but you have to, have to see the, 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 the hearing aid every, every day, putting them in. Um, that was, I, I suddenly, I think it was with one or two weeks, I realized I did not need them anymore. I could hear without <laughs> the hearing aid. I mean, that really is quite extraordinary. Professor Fockins, perhaps I can bring you in here. I mean, clearly, I mean, these are, ama these are amazing stories uh, and the, 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 the way that those symptoms change so quickly. I mean, clearly biologics, as we've heard from multiple people, are, are certainly less invasive uh, than having repeated, you know, repeated uh, nose surgery. Uh, I mean, surgery obviously has its place. What's your view on biologics? Well, it, it's a paradigm shift. It's fantastic. It's um, actually for the doctor quite boring because most patients come in and say, oh, I'm fantastic. <laughs> you changed my life. Uh, and, uh, and I always thought I was the good doctor and now it's the biological. <laughs> but just to um, bring a little bit perspective, um, uh, uh, some patients do extremely well and also extremely fast really in days but for some patients it will take months before they work so um i think it's important to mention that point that people are not um start to be upset when after a few weeks uh, the result is not as fantastic as we now describe that's also possible yeah i mean it was interesting i was reading up on on the advent of them when they sort of came uh, into mainstream use and so on and really for many clinicians i think the clinicians from from certainly the testimonials i was reading uh, they were surprised by the, many of the results the results in real life are actually even better than what we saw in the trials. And that's very exceptional because normally the trial is always a little bit better than real life, but here it's the opposite. And I, I was really surprised in the beginning when patients came back after a month and all said, of course, we started with the most severe patients in uh, end of 2019. And they all came in and said, I can smell again. <laughs> I mean, and that is what we all want as physicians, isn't it? And obviously we heard Alexandra's story there, the fact she, she said she, she had that symptom resolution so quickly. Uh, Professor de Corso, perhaps I can just bring you in here. Uh, would you reiterate those comments, your thoughts? So, uh, the, there are surely some obstacles uh, uh, about biologic uh, uh, and the most important is, is uh, high costs and we need to consider that we are talking about a long life uh, long term therapy and uh, currently not all uh, the country in euros are uh, and around the world uh, are reimbursed the cost of biologics and uh, due to costs, uh, countries are adopting different policy. And some country biologics are full reimbursed. And uh, uh, in others, people have to pay themselves biologics. So uh, this, uh, and in this moment, it is clear that opportunity for patients are not the same everywhere. We are lucky in Italy because biologics are fully reimbursed by the government. And for this reason, the use of biologics in Italy is quickly becoming more and more widespread. And now uh, they are used in every corner of the country for severe asthma and for severe chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps. And regarding the latter, only one type of biologic is now approved or uh, reimbursed in the Italy. But in the next months, two more biologic uh, will be reimbursed. And that's why in the near future, we will face the dilemma as to which biologic should be <laughs> chosen in a specific patient. Mm -hmm. And based on the principle of personalized medicine, one does not fit all. I believe that in the uh, not too distant future, we will need to improve our ability to uh, immunophenotype the patients in the routine clinical practice. And we need more data to understand in which patient we can obtain the maximum results with a specific biologic. Mm. I think that definition of endotype uh, in routine clinical practice is crucial 
crucial. This is extremely important also to reduce costs, because if we, f if we found the best treatment for the best outcome, we could minimize the cost related to non-appropriate control of uh, the disease. Yeah, you make some excellent points there. Let me bring in Professor Mullol now. Um, I mean, clearly, obviously, with the high cost, we need to ensure that we're using biologics for the right patients. Uh, that's not easy to do, is it? Uh, who benefits the best and who benefits the least? That's an enormous question, isn't it? Yeah, that's true. And, but we don't have the answers to all of these, to, to which patients will respond better. As uh, Eugenio said, we will probably need the further studies to have biomarkers of response, of good response, or those that don't respond less. From the analysis that we have done in, in the studies that have been produced of phase two and phase three, we have some approach to that. For example, the, the most severe or those that have uh, a big nasal polyposis or, or strong uh, impaired quality of life or severe loss of smell could be in part uh, those that will benefit the most. There is not clear relationship, for example, for type 2 inflammation. It, it is supposed and discussed in asthma that higher eosinophilia in blood will uh, uh, make those patients respond better. This is not so clear in the nose, because there are a couple of three studies that have been conducted uh, on that, and the, and the response is good no matter of the level of eosinophils that you have in the blood and uh, biomarkers. That probably will need some more uh, biomarkers. It is also known that most of these drugs were better after surgery. This is a great discussion if we should use uh, first uh, surgery or uh, together with the biological or after. Uh, there are some countries that uh, the indication is for both patients or both group of patients, those that have received surgery and those who doesn't. But most of the countries have this restriction. You need at least one surgery mm. to make. Probably this, uh, this is an economical uh, issue, but we know that mm. all treatments work much better after a surgery and you can control a high number of patients, maybe 40, 50% of the patients that are severe and controlled with the surgery and then uh, use it the, the, the others that we control it for the treatment with uh, biologicals. And also those that are exposed to multimorbidities, those that have uh, more than one disease, the, or the, they have the same disease expressed in different organs, such as chronic renal sinusitis with nasal polyps and asthma, and the triad with aspirin intolerance. These are those that benefit the more because they even can get these actions of reduction of aspirin sensitivity in, in, in their bodies and uh, their, their quality of life, their symptoms, mm -hmm. and, and both the upper and the airways uh, uh, lower I was improved a lot. Great. Uh, Professor Han, uh, I mean, we heard there from uh, Professor De Corso about uh, the, the fact that biologics are fully reimbursed uh, in certain countries, not in others. What was the deal in the United States? And also, do you have to go through certain hoops? Do you have to have sinus surgery first before you can use biologics? Or does it depend? Yeah, so in the U.S., we actually have three biologics that are currently approved for nasal polyps. Uh, we suspect that there will be two or three more coming down in the near future that will be approved for nasal polyps. Um, in the U.S., um, a lot of the biologics are covered by the payers or the insurance, but it's very difficult to get through the approval process. It just takes a lot of work. Uh, they either have to have surgery, we have to tell them that the, uh, the nasal polyp score, which not every um, otolaryngologist can do. Um, sometimes we'll have to document um, use of nasal steroid spray or other topical steroids which are over the counter. And so if you don't write that in the note, then sometimes that will um, have the insurance deny it. Mm. It, it. We do get it for our patients, but it is very difficult. And um, as you heard earlier, you know, now that we have 
three biologic, you know, the question is, you know, which biologic do we choose now? So that's the question that we're asking um, in the US. Uh, Professor Han, thank you very much. And thank you very much indeed to all of you uh, for excellent answers there and providing much needed clarity. Well, let's now turn to the challenges to implementation of newer and better treatments and the ambitions for future patient care. I'd like to start you, with you, if I may, Professor uh, De Corso. I mean, clearly we've talked there about having the right patient, making sure that we get the right patient, that they then are given the biologics. For you, what are the current obstacles uh, for using these biologics in clinical practice? <laughs> One obstacle is surely the the cost, and we spoke about them. That so I I will speak about another another problem because I think that uh, another crucial point is the definition of severity and of uh, control of the disease. I think that international and national guidelines and position papers have been helpful in establish in establishing specific cutoffs to measure severity of disease. It is obvious that if a patient may reach an adequate control of symptoms for many years with just one surgery plus intranasal corticosteroids, in this situation, surgery is surely more convenient than biologics. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, there are patients who will never reach appropriate control of symptoms even after undergoing surgery and cycles of systemic corticosteroids, in these patients, biologic, although more expensive, may dramatically improve patient quality of life. So we need to be more res restrictive in order to give priorities to severe patients. I personally think that now it makes no sense to repeat surgery, thereby increasing the risk of severe complication without re mm. reaching adequate control of the disease. And uh, another obstacle may be uh, the safety, but it doesn't appear to be an obstacle because the experience uh, in the trials and in real life confirmed that these are very well tolerated uh, drugs with a very low rate of serious adverse events. Some are afraid about long-term adverse uh, events or about the risk of loss of efficacy over the years. Mm. But currently, we are missing data, but we will know more in the near future, I believe. And the last point is the patient perspective. Some patients are either not adherent to chronic therapy or point blankly refuse long-term, long-life therapy. Mm. They may be influenced by wrong information or by social media. And for this, for this reason, Education is essential and Euphoria has demonstrated over the years the importance of ensuring clinicians are updated and well informed. Mm. I mean, it's really interesting, actually, you talk about safety and efficacy. That was going through my mind. Professor Fockins, can I bring you in here? I mean, clearly we've talked about cost benefit. We've talked about safety and efficacy. We've talked about longer term treatments. And obviously, patients have to be willing to go on these drugs, don't they? Definitely. And of course, we have one biological that is already on the market for 20 years for asthma, not for polyps. But at least we have the safety data that that is absolutely safe. But the other biologics are available only for a few years. And although we do not have any indication at this moment that they're not safe, and they're definitely much more safe than the systemic corticosteroids that we had to give to patients before, um, we, we, of course, need longer periods of time before we can say that. And for example, at this moment, I do not want to give a bi uh, the new biologics to patients who want to become pregnant or are mm. pregnant. Uh, on the other hand, uh, one of the important things we already mentioned, cost, but of course there it's very important how often do we need a biological. 
And um, now we do not have data to uh, significantly reduce the, the, the number of injections per year. But uh, it's very well possible that we will be able to keep the patient well controlled with far less medication per year. Mm. And that might be one of the solutions to reduce costs for the community or for the individual patient. Well, let me just bring Alexandra back in now because, I mean, I was really struck by you saying it didn't matter whether it took 10 years off your life because obviously the, the improvement was so significant. Were you ever worried about the safety of these drugs? Um, of course, of course. Um, and um, I, one of my, our youngest daughter, she is having the same symptoms as I do have now. She's 26. And I, uh, as Dr. Fokken says, uh, yeah, with pregnancy, I, I wonder if I, you know, I want to join her to hospital to see if, if this is the only solution. Because, mm. you know, for me, and this is also a question I have, I am almost uh, 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 nearing my 60s. Uh, is there a certain age that the uh, illness without any uh, medicine uh, will be controlled uh, due to, yeah, sometimes you read on the internet that if people have a certain age, this polyps may be gone <laughs> without <laughs> any treatment. Yeah, I mean, let me bring in Professor Mullall then, uh, just in terms of, of, of the length of treatment here. Just, just from, is there anything you want to add here in terms of uh, talking to patients about safety, efficacy, uh, duration of treatment, how long they have to be on these? Of course. Uh, well, the, the duration of treatment is something that we don't know. The, the experience with asthma, uh, or severe asthma, there's the, the potential equivalent to that, is patients are treated for three, four, five. Most of our asthma, severe asthma patients are treated for more than six years, some mm -hmm. of them. Some the, the others can be tapered down, as Professor Falkens uh, said, that this is a, a rich possibility. About safety, I totally agree with her. That means we, we don't have any notice in the new biologicals that a high number of patients or, or, or a significant number of patients could have a strong uh, side effects. Mm. I remember one patient that in the clinical trial have a, a local erythema and uh, that was growing injection after injection and we had to stop, to withdraw from the study and uh, she was crying and uh, as it has been said before, she said that uh, she preferred the risk of having an adverse effect such as anaphylaxia than uh, being removed from the clinical trial because she felt so. Mm -hmm. that, is, that is the magnitude that uh, these patients can, can, can be linked to, mm -hmm. to this treatment that is for most of them very beneficial. I mean, that's beautifully illustrated uh, there. Thank you very much indeed. Professor Han, I mean, clearly cost is going to be an issue. Healthcare is very, very expensive, increasingly expensive. How do we get industry to pull down the cost of these drugs? I mean, is it partly that it's a, it's it's going to be a passage of time? Uh, it's obviously as they come off patent, but also uh, is it the, the more patients that are on them, we can drive down cost? Is there something that we can do? You know, I, I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, uh, I, I think it's going to have to be a multiple factors that have to be involved, whether it be the pharmaceutical companies, the distributors of these medications, or even the, the governments, the national governments themselves, um, developing, you know, restrictions on, you know, how much um, to charge for these medications. Uh, as you heard, these are game-changing um, uh, medications for patients who have a severe disease with severe quality of life. Um, mm. The cost of these medications is a burden. Um, and I think regardless of where you live, it is, a, it is an international issue. Um, I, I will say that one thing that we have noticed um, over time, um, with use of a lot of these biologic or nasal polyps, is that you know um, before COVID, most of the patients who were getting biologics were coming into our office and getting it every two weeks. Mm 
or every four weeks, uh, depending on the uh, the frequency in which these biologics were supposed to be given. And so they would come into our office, we would give it to them, and we can kind of regulate, you know, how frequently we gave it. Um, but then when COVID hit, a lot of these patients wanted to learn how to give these injections themselves. And, and a lot of these biologics are considered safe by a lot of these regulatory uh, agency to be given at home because the risk of anaphylaxis and such are pretty low. And so what we noticed over time is these patients who are administering the biologics themselves, what we noticed over time was um, that they would feel so good so that they would start increasing the length of time between injections. And they were still having pretty good results as long as they were on topical steroids. And so, I mean, that is another way of decreasing cost in a way, but I'm not sure if that is the right way to decrease cost. <laughs> well, thank you very much indeed. That's a, that's a brilliant point there. And thank you to all of you about uh, all those comments on the challenges we face and indeed the ambitions to improve patient care uh, around the world. Very quickly, if I may, I want to just get your final thoughts, if you can encapsulate everything uh, that uh, we've been talking about today. If I may start with you, Alexandra, I mean, I think your story is remarkable. What is the final message you want to leave our viewing audience with? Uh, I am very happy with the attention to this um, chronic disease because I think, you know, it's not that you're talking about having a cold. And, uh, you know, if you, if you have this disease, a lot of people think, oh, you're having a cold. But, you know, with what Euphoria do, does with the, with the things they publish is that more people know what is behind this illness. Yeah, I know. Brilliant, brilliant. And Professor Mullol, uh, your thoughts, how do you wrap up this conversation? Well, only to say that uh, uh, severe patients with chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps should uh, talk with their uh, doctors and, uh, and re realize together what, the, what is the better treatment. Uh, not the solution is always in the side of biologicals and uh, uh, treatment with surgery and uh, the standard of care treatment also is very important before reaching this severity. I think that the conversation and the agreement and the final solution taken together between doctors and patients is the best uh, to control this severe disease. Professor Han, your final thoughts. Uh, what do you want to leave uh, people who are watching this? What message do you want to leave them with? So I'm very grateful that we have a new class of treatment option for our patients with severe nasal polyps. Um, and if you look at the clinical studies looking at all the biologics for nasal polyps, they all worked. But it wasn't all 100%. So what would be great is if we can identify which biologic would really work well with specific type of nasal polyp patients so that we can mm -hmm. get to that level of 100% efficacy to the point where every patient on a biologic gets that improvement. Right now, we don't have that information. Uh, we're still researching that. Um, so we still have a little ways to go um, to get um, high, high efficacy results for all the biologics, but I think we're getting there. But we're just grateful that we do have this new treatment option. Brilliant points. Uh, Dr. Eugenio de Corso, your final thoughts? So I think uh, uh, it's very important to uh, explain our patients uh, what it, it is important to improve their quality of life because sometimes they uh, accept their condition and they don't understand that the condition can change because we have new opportunity for uh, for them and uh, we i think also we have to educate uh, our uh, ent colleagues because it's very important to help them in the understand the indication uh, to how to measure the disease and also uh, it's important to uh, very well explain 
place in therapy and uh, uh, what is the target to treat uh, uh, of the patients. And uh, finally, I think we have to enjoy with our patient the success of this drug. <laughs> uh, well, I couldn't agree more. Uh, Professor witzker Falkins, perhaps I could bring you in last, but by no means least here. I mean, really, we've heard some fascinating stories. We've heard how it's a game changer, how we have to have the right patient on the right medication. What, what are your final thoughts uh, and, and how do you view where we are and where we're going. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bull. I think this has been a, a, an, an excellent um, discussion on all the aspects of treating chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps. Extremely important to understand the impact on quality of life. Important that patients realize that they have a serious disease and that they are entitled to uh, all the uh, care that uh, proper care that uh, healthcare providers have to give them, uh, and whether that is um, a local treatment, whether that is surgery, or in some patients eventually a biologic is needed, uh, is at the moment uh, a, a matter of discussion between the healthcare provider, the doctor, and the patient. And of course, that is shifting over time. Uh, 10 years ago, we did have biomedicals for nasal polyps. And what will happen in 10 years, nobody knows. Whether uh, chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps will eventually be a, uh, a curable disease um, with limited resources needed uh, is not clear at the moment. But yeah. I hope that um, what we show today will give patients a lot of hope of what is possible in this um, terrible disease that they have at the moment. I couldn't put it better myself. Thank you so much to all of you. Well, sadly, that's all we have time for. Many thanks indeed to my panel for their thoughts and comments. And it really has been a fascinating debate. And I really want to thank all of them for sharing their thoughts, their views and their aspirations. So many thanks to my guests, to Alexandra Banning, to Professor Wakim Mullol, Professor Joe Han, Dr Eugenio de Corso and Professor Witzger Fockins. And thank you to all of you for watching this Euphoria Innovation Forum debate on setting the new gold standard for CRS WMP treatment. And I really hope that you found it useful, informative, but most of all, it is really important that you take forward everything that you've learned and you implement it in your clinical practice. Now you can find more information about Euphoria and also register for the Euphoria meetings on the euphoria.eu website, where you can also sign up to receive the latest news via email. And don't forget to follow us on socials for all the latest news and information. But from all of us here, goodbye.